Yeah, you're like orange. No, that's that's orange. Also, you're really short. Do you want to you know you want me to get you a telephone book to sit on? Maybe I'm white. Maybe that, oh maybe you know what it is. I probably have a different color. Oh, there we go. Oh, now now I look like you. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the AI Guys podcast, where we make artificial intelligence easy to understand for everyone. I'm your host, Lee Dixon, and as always, I'm joined by the man who's often imitated but never automated, Rich Swire. How are we doing today? Like yeah, you like that one? Pretty good. I'm doing great. A little tired, but I'm ready to talk AI, you know? That's what I came here to do. Yeah. Well, we're going to do some quick hit episodes, uh, you know, over the next few to really, I think, start helping companies and people that listen to the podcast define what different types of solutions are out there. We've talked about in a handful of episodes. I think AI just gets an all-encompassing term, but between platforms and a lot of other you know solutions that are out there, it can get a little hazy. So today we're actually going to really focus on a quick hit episode talking about like a platform, let's say like what we have here at Rhea versus automation platforms. You could think of the Zapiers, the N8Ns, the Makes, things like that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, um, we've talked about this in, in a few episodes where, you know, we're kind of drifting toward this new stack where the building out an agentic um, solution, you know, requires a lot of different layers uh, beyond the LLM, right? The LLM is really just kind of the, you know, core uh, brain, I guess, if of the AI, if you will. Um, but reality is if you want to give agents agency and you want to give them the ability to actually act on and take action on um you know what it's doing whether you're prompting to do it or whether it's autonomous behind the scenes and so in order to do this you need to have some sort of workflow right you need yeah. to have some sort of that classic uh if everybody imagines like a flow chart in their head uh, if then do this and mm -hmm. go here and get that information bring it back and go over it's there call and, and response yeah yeah no different no different than what an employee would do right if right. an employee was to um you say this is your job and this is what you need to take you know, this document down to accounting and then get them to respond and fill out this paperwork and take it over to sales. You know, it's the same thing, right? Workflow is part of our everyday lives. And obviously in the spirit of AI, which is the another kind of um, goal, I think, is to uh, remove the complexity of code and also the latency of code, right? You want to be able to build this without having to require a development team to go in there and hardwire all this, right? So the rise of the workflow engine has kind of been happening side by side with the rise of deployment of AI, yeah. um, specifically AI agents and agentic solutions. So, you know, there's obviously some old school, uh, I guess, um, you know, workflow engines like Zapier, which were really more um, built around integrating apps and integrating third party apps to your software, or if you wanted to trigger uh, some sort of action, even just from another app. Um, it was a great, easy way to connect APIs, thus the name Zapier. And then, of course, you have new ones coming out of the woodwork, uh, like the open source movement has driven uh, a lot of companies like N8N, which have come to the um, you know, forefront as far as building out these agentic workflows. Um, and then, of course, there's Make, and there's a, a wide variety. So, you know, pick your poison, I guess, and choose one, but they all pretty much work the same way, where you're connecting the dots and you're trying to give an input and they, it achieves an output. But the thing that you have to be concerned about with these workflow engines is that they can get very spaghetti, you know, very hairy, very quickly, right? Yeah. You can have 30, 50, 100 of these little workflow sequences, and it becomes hard to manage. So yep. you want to, you want to make sure that when you are, you know, kind of building these out, that you're following some sort of, um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, consistent methodology, you know, yeah. uh, and not get too carried away. Well, actually, with that same thought, though, I, the bringing everything to like a platform, let's say, that centralizes the oversight is another big one. Because I do agree that, you know, where we hear a lot of clients that are starting to experiment with AI, it, it, the manual piece and like the node structure of something like N8N is really nice because it's a great visualization. It allows them to kind of take a concept they really don't know and bring it to something that feels a little bit more like, you know, usable for them versus just the mystification of what AI is. But 
I do think you're right on the point that as time goes on, it becomes extremely manual and then potentially very brittle with all these workflows, especially when they start engaging with each other. If you don't have something that can operate as kind of like the central hub where all of it can live and like really be ingested through. Yeah, I mean, I think where it starts to get really um, hairy is, um, you know, when you're connecting, for example, in a workflow, if you just imagine, let's take a simple workflow, like you're going to want to have an AI agent connect to your Salesforce or your HubSpot or your CRM and then grab some sort of prospect and then have it, you know, go through a series of steps and then qualify that prospect and eventually go back to the CRM and put a note in. So that would be an example of a simple workflow. All those components, you know, connecting to Salesforce, pretty consistent, not too crazy. Uh, you know, being able to process uh, the if then, uh, you know, if kind this, of logic. Then that, yeah. But when it, when it comes when it gets really, uh, you know, tough to manage is if you kind of put all of the logic of what you're connecting um, as far as how you're conversing with the AI. That's where it gets a little bit crazy, you know, and where you start to get. Uh, a little less uh, fault tolerant in the sense of mm. like if you're connecting to the model directly versus like a platform like Raya, which what we built, you start to have to hard code things like the instructional prompts. You're hard coding the model. Yep. You're hard coding. You're having to track, you know, kind of the thread in the session. Yeah. And then if you're using any sort of, you know, communication uh, like a Twilio or an email a client or something like that, that becomes even more complicated because now you have to maintain that conversation. So it becomes this kind of looped um, experience. So, you know, one of the things that we kind of preach on our side is separation of, of layers, right? So you want to maintain your agents, your instructional prompting, your training, and all of your communication layer in a separate platform. And then that communicates back to the workflow. So the workflow, instead of having that, you know, kind of baked in and hard coded, which means you have to come back every time you want to, make a tweak to the instructional prompt, which is typically not the developer, it's typically like a business user, they, they're gonna have to log into N8N, which is what you don't want, mess with your workflow, which is what you don't want, and then, <laughs> yeah. uh, or find the workflow, you know, which is amongst, yeah. I'm sure, 50 or 100 or 200, versus log into a platform that's more- uh, User-friendly you know, and- Business-friendly, yeah. and, and adjust the prompts or upload documents or adjust training. And then know that the workflow will continue to operate and work. So it is kind of like separating, uh, you know, a good a comparison would be separating the front end design of an application to the back end database, right? That's uh, that's an obvious thing that developers yeah. you know, believe wholeheartedly that that is a better thing. Like you have the designers with the style sheet and the HTML interface and and the React or whatever you're using, um, and that that whole UX, the user experience, is separate from the the services, the APIs, the database queries that you're building on the back end. You know, nobody would ever, in, uh, you know, incorporate those into one piece of code. And this correlates exactly to that. You would never want to have your agentic, plat, uh, you know, management of your uh, agents and your control of your agents integrated into the workflow components. You would just want to communicate back and forth programmatically through an API instead of hard coding it in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that, And that's a good way to look at it, too, because I do think, you know, we we see the in interactions that take place with AI is usually like one to one. So once the developers built something, let's say for a company, and they wanted to build it in house, and that's that's the ownership of it. When it then gets handed to either the business individual or a department that's going to leverage it, there isn't really a way for them to maintain it like consistently. And that conversational layer being where we see a lot of these use cases coming out, not just in the early stages, but where a lot of like companies are investing their time into AI, like the grandiose plans of analysts that can do all this stuff behind the scenes, like just picturing like the IBMs in the world, right? All great. But that's such a small portion of where most businesses can leverage AI today. So that conversational layer with like, let's say a workflow or an automation tool, not really having something built in and taking it from your vision of like, hey, this is primarily like backend workflow and really developer friendly that hinders a lot of the use cases or at least where people can take AI in the early stages. They have to allocate resources and budgets and all this other really heavy stuff that they probably already are thinking like, this is going to be such a headache and it just delays the project from actually getting going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a wide array of complexity in use cases. Right. And I think, I do think that the, the 80, 20 rule does apply here in the sense that, 
you're getting a lot of use cases with AI that are centered around building out a conversational agent. And what I mean by a conversational agent is exactly what you just outlined, which is this agent's primarily job is to go talk to somebody. And it's given instructions on what it needs to gather as far as data or information, whether that's a sales agent saying, hey, I got go qualify this lead, or if it's a support agent say, hey, go clarify the support ticket, or if it's an internal agent saying, hey, go, go ask this person if, you know, um, if, if they want to uh, update their HR records. And it's a conversational agent, just like you're replacing like a human and telling the human to walk across the, the hall and go ask so-and-so a question and come back with the answer. And what you'll find is actually about eight, you know, about 80% of what a worker does in the day is conversational. You know, very it's it, it does end up in some sort of system, right? Sure. I go out and I do a lot of conversation. I have a lot of meetings. I talk about a lot of things. I talk to this guy, that guy, and I combine it all and I summarize it. And yeah, maybe at the end of the day, I go into my CRM or my, you know, workbook or whatever it might be, or my accounting system, whatever, whatever your job is. Yeah. And then you put the final results in. And essentially, we are great summarizers of data based on the communication. So to be able to deploy agents that can communicate and give instructions and then bring back that information at scale, you want to be able to do that in your platform. And that's, yep. that's exactly why we built Raya was you don't want to have the inertia of having to build out a complicated workflow engine or anything like that. Now, we obviously do support in those cases where it does become more complicated, where you do need a kind of a series of uh, sequences and a more of a complicated uh, action from, you know, beginning to end. And that might include things like integrating with multiple third party apps. It might, it might include multiple agents talking through a workflow, or it might also just include the fact that you want to make it autonomous and it just runs every five minutes. And so that's when it's beautiful to take like a Raya platform and integrate it and use the N8N, you know, workflow engine, you know, combining those two together, you get the full power of those yep. more complicated solutions, but you don't necessarily want to have to require that if you want to deploy in mass, a communication based, you know, conversational based agent. Yeah. You know, so there's, you, know, you talked about when we opened the show, like the, the nuances and the differences between, you know, using the word AI today is like saying the word software, you know, mm. you, you know, Instagram is software, but so is, you know, you know, Microsoft Outlook. And so is, you know, Salesforce, right? Yeah. All, all different use cases, all different, completely different architectures. So I think what people are starting to realize is when people say AI agent, what they, what, if you were to break that down in more detail, you're saying, okay, is it a conversational agent? Meaning is its job going to go talk to people and gather information and, or is it more of an autonomous agent? Is it running in the background and, and, and running through some sort of instructions and rule sets to, you know, maybe it's constantly, maybe it's a marketing autonomous agent that's constantly searching the web for content and writing blogs and posting them on the, on the blog, right. You know, on the, on the website, well then, you know, or, you know, is it a, more of a complicated, uh, agentic, you know, application, right? And that's where we're starting yeah. to see today with, you know, with the ability for AI to code is you're starting to see AI, you know, kind of build its own applications, its yeah. own user experiences. So that wide variety of complexity, obviously, beckons for picking the right tool for the right job. Yeah. That being said, you don't want to, you want your common denominator to be not to not to lose sight of the fact that you want to be able to deploy AI yeah. in a safe and secure environment and 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 leverage a zero or no code uh, capability for that eighty to twenty rule, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to have to say, okay, we're going to deploy a simple sales agent that goes out and qualifies leads, and then have to invoke, you know, <laughs> it's a like team going of, to Home uh, Depot every time you yeah. need a new tool. Like you're like, oh, yeah. I guess I need a hammer, and yeah, like back you, to the you internet. Yeah, you don't want to go and have to get an army of developers and wait six months mm -hmm. and have them develop this thing from scratch. And yeah, and whereas you could spin it up in five minutes with like a platform like Raya. So you have to pick and choose and understand, OK, is this a complex scenario where I might require some of these other things? OK, let's 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 map it out. Let's do it the correct way. Or is this something that we can spin up and launch and get active uh, and have a lot more flexibility and extensibility? Um, you know, these are decisions you have to make when building these things. But it is important, you know, which is the point of this episode is you have to, you know, know the difference between a platform and a, and, and a workflow engine and why you would need both and why it's better to have both, you know, just for that reason. You don't want to sacrifice security, simplicity, speed, and of course, uh, you, know, comp you know, making sure that you can scale. You know, those are like the big ones that if you kind of shove all this 
like in, into a workflow engine and, and, and say like, it's going to be your, your one, you know, it's going to be the silver bullet that's going to solve all problems. Yeah. You're going to wake up one day with 38, 50, a hundred workflows that you're like, okay. And then they're all sort of going to solve all going to break because, you know, you kind of escaped, uh, you know, a, a really solid infrastructure and that that's really yeah. kind of the point. Yeah. I, I think you covered kind of my last little topic here and we'll kind of wrap up on this, but it absolutely is a conversation around scale and like what a team really wants to take on, because I do think there are a lot of dev shops in both small organizations as well as enterprise that like to have the control over what they've built because they don't want to think of this as, oh, well, what if that company goes away? But very different than traditional software is the conversation around AI agents where you start to get into, well, what if we didn't have an HR department and we have 100 employees? Like, who do I go to to understand like what our salespeople are doing, what their comp plans are, like all this kind of stuff. Like, if you don't have somewhere that allows for all of that organization to live, then everyone is just kind of operating on whatever they need to. And workflows, albeit they have a start and a stop, you don't have the control at scale that you think you do when you're starting with just, oh, it would be really cool if we built X and Jim yeah. knows how to build X. So let's just let him do that. Like you get into this bottleneck, whether it's at five workflows or like you were saying 50, or one day you just wake up and go, oh, Jim retired. <laughs> or, mm -hmm. oh, Jim Jim decided that he's he's going to go work for yeah. a competitor. And then, God, we have right. all of this and no one knows Or imagine like you have one, let's say you built out this really cool um, sales agent or operational agent yeah. that, that has been trained, which is another component that workflows don't do, yeah. on a wide variety of information. But then now you've implemented that same agent in 30 workflows, right? That means you either have 30 copies of this agent that's hard coded into those workflows, or you have one copy of this agent that's well tested and maintained in a platform. Yeah, and then you're connect, and all thirty workflows are connected to the same agent. Exactly, right? and then you pat you pass one touch, and then it goes back to all thirty deployments. Yeah, and it's common sense stuff because you can think about all the nightmare situations. Okay, now we have to upgrade the model of that agent. Okay, do you want to do it thirty times, or do you don't want to do it once? And do you want to make sure? And what happens if the thirty times it breaks, right? Yeah. Um, or they forget to upgrade the one thirty time, or you know, whatever. Yeah. And someone then, moves. Someone moves all of them over to a yeah. reasoning model when it doesn't need to be there, and then their yeah, price yeah. jacks up. Like there's so yeah, much. Yeah, I think I think it's just control, and it's and and understanding that centralized management, um, which I don't think anybody would disagree with, is is what you ultimately want to achieve, and that's exactly why agentic platforms exist. They integrate with workflow engines, just like they integrate with large language models. They're part of the stack, but they're part of the upper part of the stack that makes life easier for you to manage, uh, you know, what will be hundreds of workforce, um, you know, uh, agentic, your agentic workforce will be hundreds of agents, thousands of agents for some companies, all doing random things. You, you want to have a platform that manages that. And it, it doesn't mean that you don't need a workflow engine. It doesn't mean that you don't need a large language model, you know, but it's, it's keeping those things separate. And understanding the value of each one independently, yep. but also, of course, them working together makes maximizes your ROI. Yeah, it's the toolbox. Everything's in there. Mm -hmm. Grab the pieces you need for the, the work that's getting done. So I love right. it. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for joining us on this episode. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button to stay in touch. Also, check out our Substack for more content, which we link to this episode to continue this discussion. Until next time, stay curious, stay informed, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care, everyone. Welcome to the show Where air takes the flow Leah Rich on the mic